uh, I would like to welcome you here on uh, my talk, which is about Java EE 8 and what next. Uh, safe Herbert statement, basically the presentation itself is for information purposes only and uh, you should not make any purchasing decisions based on this presentation. Who am I? I am Lukas Jungmann. I work an, uh, at Oracle as a software developer. Uh, I am responsible mainly for JPA, JAXWS, SAGE, JSRs. Uh, where I am spec lead. Uh, I am also participating in other JSRs, uh, such as JSONB, JSONP, also JAXB. And apart from that, uh, I also work on some projects. The biggest one there is Eclipse Link project, Ec Eclipse Link project. Among others, uh, I contributed also to Metro, uh, Glassfish, and other EE-related technologies. Uh, here is my today's agenda. At the beginning, I will talk briefly about the road to Java E8. Then we will go through the content of current E8. In the end, uh, I'll share some news about what's going to be next. And I hope there will be enough time for your questions and maybe my answers. It depends on how the question will look like. So brief history about EE8. Uh, the work on EE8 started in 2014, so almost three years ago, when uh, we, as a Oracle employees and spec lead, submitted uh, new JSRs. But for some reason, uh, for almost a year, uh, we were directed to other higher priority tasks than to work on EE8, uh, but in the end uh, there was a change in the focus and in 2016 we revisited the plan, did some adjustments and uh, finally released uh, Java EE8 last month. So almost three years after initial start of the work. What we originally planned to do is listed here. Uh, I would say that the, the most important part he, parts here are JSONB, uh, JSONP, uh, CDI, and JAXRS. I will talk about these later. Uh, when there was a change in the focus, or uh, we realized that there is some time we have to really release E8, we also had to revisit this plan because uh, there wasn't enough time to deliver this on time. So what we did was a community survey, which was done in 2016. And we asked community what to do, uh, what to deprioritize. And in the end, uh, on the table on the right side, you can see the results of that survey. And the output is clear. Uh, the community asked for uh, uh, web technologies, for update on the web technology side. And basically, uh, there was no or limited interest in management, in updates to management, JMS, and MVC. On the other hand, uh, MVC itself has been finished uh, by the expert group, and it's final but it is not part of uh, Java E8 platform. So updated plan was like this. Basically, we excluded uh, Java me uh, messaging service, uh, MVC, and uh, Java E management APIs. But the rest remained unchanged uh, with some minor updates within the scope of what to do. So let's go about uh, through the content of E8 in terms of JSRs. Uh, the main focus area of E8 was modernization and simplification. Uh, 
This means uh, enhancements in the web tier area, mainly HTTP2 support, ease of development in terms of CDI alignment, and improvements uh, in security area. Basically, there is completely new Java security uh, JSR. First JSR I will briefly describe is JSONP. It lies at the core, uh, at the bottom of the stack, and it's quite simple. Uh, JSONP 1.0 uh, was part of Java E7. And uh, for Java E8, we wanted to uh, the spec to stay current with emerging uh, standards, mainly JSON pointer, JSON patch, and JSON merge patch. Another improvement were in addition of JSON collectors and support for processing big JSON. Uh, I didn't say what the JSONP itself is. It's a standard API to parse, generate, transform, and query JSON. Uh, basically, if you have some JSON string and you need a parser, JSONP is for you. Now let's go through particular uh, standards. Uh, JSON pointer is defined by, uh, in RFC, and it's basically a string based syntax for identifying a specific value within a JSON document. Uh, tokens are separated by slash. Uh, basically, uh, it defines, a string defines a key in an object, or if there is a number, it can be indexed in, a, in an array. For, in, uh, for example, uh, there can be some event location or conferences on the first index. It also allows some special, uh, special characters, like relative indexing and so on. So let's take a look uh, at the example. So uh, say we want to, uh, say we have a document on the right side and we want to update some value there or create an updated version of the document. Uh, and say Java 1 has been moved from Hotel Hilton to some other venue. So we create a pointer, we get the value, this returns some uh, value, and then we can replace it. Uh, JSON, uh, the pointer itself modi uh, never modifies original, original document, always, it always creates new JSON structure. It also defines few other methods like add, uh, remove, or contains value. Uh, contains value itself may be quite useful uh, in JSONP 1.0 if, uh, if one wasn't sure if, uh, that some value was present in JSON or some key, then uh, we basically had to check for null Nowadays, uh, there's direct contains value method. JSON patch, on the other hand, allows you to modify parts of a JSON document. It's based on a, a JSON array. The JSON pa uh, the patch itself is uh, the patch is a JSON document itself. It uh, has defined structure. Uh, which I will show you on the next slide, and uh, some predefined set of operations, basically at replace, remove, move, copy, and test. Uh, so, for example, here uh, on the left side, we have some JSON patch, and on the right side, we have a document which we want to update, or patch. The patch defines two operations, replace and add, so let's see what happens with the first one. It says uh, operation replace on path uh, zero when is. So uh, the first uh, object in the target, target document, its attribute when is, should be updated to Moscone West. So in the end, what happens is that 
when it will be updated to Moscow West. Now, if we want to add new entry, we just add to first object uh, new key or new attribute previous when Hilton. Uh, JSON patch can be also created programmatically using create patch method and applied using apply method. Or uh, you can use also patch builder uh, with predefined operations. So you basically, there's an API which allows you to uh, define particular operations. So here we want to copy previous venue to venue, replace the venue to something else, and add a new property called base. And then we can build it, uh, build the patch, and apply it. JSON merge patch is another kind of patch. Uh, the difference between merge patch and patch is that uh, this mer merge patch uh, describes a set of modifications to the tar target and it's, pr uh, it's primarily intended for use with uh, HTTP patch method. Uh, again, uh, application of such patch is same as with the uh, previous kind of patch. Only difference is that you create a merge patch instead of create patch. Uh, how does it work? on the target document. So on the left side, there is some original document. On the right side, there is a merge patch. What happens is that what does not exist, what is in the merge patch and does not exist in the original, original document, such property is added to original document. Uh, here we can see that on uh, developer keynote property. If uh, property exists in uh, original document, then it is updated to a new value. And uh, if the value of to be updated property is set to null, then, it's, uh, then such property is removed from original document. So in the end, uh, after application of this match patch, we end up with uh, document having just event addition venue and developer keynote properties and updated addition year. Uh, Complement to uh, patch operation is uh, ability to uh, create a diff between two JSON documents. Uh, JSONP provides API for that. Uh, you can, one can create a regular diff uh, which outputs a JSON patch or create a merge diff which outputs a JSON merge patch. Uh, one uh, not nice thing on uh, JSONP 1.0 was uh, uh, using streams. If you want to iterate through some or transform a JSON object and work with it as a JSON array, you basically had to uh, write your own collector, which is not nice. So in JSONP 1.1, we edit uh, JSON collectors, which simplifies this. Another improvement in JSON P101 is processing uh, support for processing big JSON. That means that uh, we edit the uh, ability to <coughs> skip particular array or object. Uh, say you have uh, some JSON document some with some property which contains some binary data or something, and you know uh, you are not interested in this, so you can just skip whole content. And the uh, important thing here is that JSONP itself does not contain any specification. The Java doc of uh, the API is the specification in this case. Uh, 
one of the new APIs in uh, EE8 is JSONB. Uh, JSONB stands for uh, JSON binding. It provides API to serialize the serialized Java objects from and to JSON. It's a uh, natural follow-up onto JSONP. And basically, it's uh, almost the same as uh, JAXB in XML world. If you are used to uh, use JAXB, then this API should be familiar to you. It provides some default mapping between classes and JSON. It provides also a lot of customizations, uh, customization APIs. So if you want default, it works. If you are not satisfied with defaults, you can customize it as you want. Uh, the API itself is uh, built on top of existing frameworks. It's not something uh, written from scratch. Uh, the key entry point to the API from the cl uh, client's perspective is a class JSON builder. It uh, has some operations for selecting provi provider implementation, for instance, or setting some configuration properties. And from uh, this builder, you can create a JSONB object, which then uh, allows you to, uh, to serialize or deserialize uh, object from or to JSON. JSONB itself is an interface. It, ha it has a bunch of various from JSON or to JSON methods. From JSON, you can work with string reader, input stream to JSON to serialize your, thing, uh, your data. You can use writer, output stream. It's up to you. As for defo by default, there are some default mappings. mappings. So uh, if you have some like Java beans or some simple POJOs, then you can just use JSONB to, to uh, serialize them to JSON. Uh, for example, if we have something like this, some event, some list of events, and we want to serialize it to JSONB, uh, to JSON format, we can just create a JSONB instance using JSONB Builder and call to JSON. In the end, we end up with a JSON document like this. It may not be formatted this way, but the content will be the same. Uh, the reverse operation works similarly. We just need to pass a type to which uh, the JSON object sh should be deserialized into or serialized into. Uh, supported by the uh, default mapping, support some basic types and some specific types. I don't want to go through them. It's a long, quite a long list. Basically, some, all basic types are supported plus some specific types. Uh, date time uh, objects are also supported to some extent with some specifics. Arrays and collections are supported by default as well. And there's a lot of customization options. Uh, for example, say we have some event object with some event name property, but in JSON we don't want to see an event name, we want to uh, the property to be called conference. So we can use uh, JSONB property annotation to overwrite this name. It can be used either on, the, on top of the property or field or on a getter, etc. Uh, another customization options are like changing naming strategies. Uh, by default, it's identity. So if my property is called my prop with upper P, then in JSON document, uh, I will have exactly this property. 
but sometimes uh, one needs to rename it somehow or don't want to use uh, upper cases, only lower cases, or it can be case insensitive, then there are options to override default behavior. Or if you want something really specific, like you have really long names and you have some uh, algorithm to shorten this, you can write your own implementation which will take care of it. Uh, again, property ordering can also be customized binary data strategies as well. Default fields order is uh, lexicographical from uh, parent class to ch child class. So say we have this parent class and we serialize it to JSON. We end up with a document having parent A and parent B properties in this particular order, regardless of how they are defined within the class. If we extend this class and add two new properties, then this will be sorted lexicographically as well and put in the end after the parent properties. Another set of cust possible customizations is related to uh, property to ignore. Uh, from JAXB you may know uh, pro uh, annotation XML transient. From JPA there is also some transient pro uh, annotation. So in JSONB similar annotation is as well. Uh, you can customize how null values are handled, how instantiation of objects is handled, visibility of fields, date, number formatting, and more. Uh, sometimes uh, you have an object which is not able to be, or which can't be simply serialized to JSON. In this case, and you want it to be uh, serialized. So in this case, there are two options provided. First one is using adapter, which is similar to what uh, JAXB is using or JPA is using. Uh, basically, you implement an interface with an operation and uh, the implementation will take care of uh, transforming your object to something what JSONB or JSON format understands. If this is not enough, uh, then you can use a serializer, the serializer implementation. And in this case, you get access to underlying uh, JSONP parser. So in this case, you really get to lowest level access you can get. So how, another option how you can customize uh, JSON B, apart from using annotations, because sometimes you can't modify the code, you can use JSON B config and pass that to JSON B builder. So in this case, we are telling JSON B builder through JSON B config that we want output to be formatted, and uh, we have some car objects and for which we have some specific car adapter. Uh, in case you want to use different provider, say you've written your own my provider, which is the best one and suits your needs, you still can use JSONB API. You just create JSONB using new builder method on JSONB builder and pass the name of your provider to it. Another set of improvements went to JAX-RS. Uh, the most notable ch changes were in the, uh, are that uh, new reactive client API has been added, uh, new method for pausing request processing, uh, support for server sent events, support for JSONP and JSONB. So again, this builds on top of JSONP and JSONB I talked about earlier. And some providers ordering. So uh, in 2.0, if we 
created a client called uh, get a target, create a request, call a get on it, and work with the request and close. So basically, this is an example of Fluent API, which goes through, or kind of a Fluent API, which goes through building a client, through client itself, web, tar web target, request building, up to the response. In 2.0, there were two invokers, uh, one synchronous and the other one asynchronous. The only difference was that uh, asynchronous invoker returned future instead of direct response and you had to explicitly ask for it. What you got uh, was something, uh, some future, and you had to deal with it. What that mean or meant is that there could have been some timeout. Or maybe better approach, you had to wait until a request completes. Then you could get the response. If you want to overcome this limitation, or kind of limitation, you could implement your own invocation callback interface. Uh, this gave you option to react on completed event or failed event directly. So how it looked like? So basically we passed invocation callback implementation to the client invocation itself. So we end up with something like this. In JAXRS 2.1, uh, new reactive client has been added. Basically, uh, this returns a completion stage. What this allows you to do is you basically use the completion stage coming from GD, uh, Java SE 8, which really simplifies your code. Uh, another benefit of this is it improves performance and scalability. It's easier to develop and maintain, and it leverages new Java SE features. Uh, the goal, one of the goals of uh, EE8 was to build it on top of SE8 and try to leverage some of the features introduced there. As for this uh, reactive invoker, the specification itself mandates that implementations must support at least completion stage. So if you want to use it, you are guaranteed that uh, compliant implementation will support this. Different implementations may support also other reactive APIs. For instance, Jersey supports a bit more. Uh, there were also improvements in handling long-running operations. So basically, this is the way this was handled uh, using JAXRS 2.0. In 2.1, again, completion stage has been introduced. So it's simpler. Another item in uh, JAXRS 2.1 was server-sent events. Uh, it's a standard, it's persistent uh, one-way communication channel, uh, it's a text protocol, and basically server can send multiple messages to the client. The event itself can contain ID, name, command, retry interval, and uh, data in some form. Uh, server sent events are supported in all modern browsers. Apparently, uh, Microsoft Edge doesn't consider itself as a modern browser, uh, because last time I checked this, which was yesterday and today morning, they still set under consideration. So who knows? Uh, the key interface uh, for this feature is SSE event interface, which defines some properties, and this Interface is extended uh, 
by two particular kinds. One implementations, one for outbound or server side representation and inbound, which means client side representation of the event. Uh, the difference between these two is uh, in a way how these events are co being constructed and uh, how data there uh, within these events are handled. Uh, on the server side, the key API is server uh, event sync. Basically, it's a context parameter uh, passed to a uh, endpoint method. So if we want to send some event from the server to a client, we just send it to a sync. Maybe another event. And don't forget to close it. Uh, on the client side, uh, the event is uh, representing uh, with uh, SSE event source. So say we have a target, we want to uh, receive some event and we want to check it, uh, for its presence every five seconds. Uh, what we want to do with the event, we want to print it out and open a channel. That's it. A uh, few more improvements, uh, as I've mentioned, were tied to JSONP, JSONB support, a uh, few new methods, uh, support for a patch or a HTTP operation. Uh, Servlet 4.0 and JSF 2.3. Uh, the main goal or the most visible improvement or user visible improvement in uh, Servlet 4.0 is support for HTTP2 protocol, which uh, is, uh, has been created or, uh, to address some limitations of HTTP 1.x. Basically, the uh, main goals were to reduce latency, support parallelism, address the head of line blocking problem, and ultimate goal, or one of the most important goals, was to retain semantics of HTTP 1.1. So, as I've mentioned, uh, Servlet 4.0 came with uh, uh, support for HTTP 2. Uh, another notable change is support for a server push and few more improvements. Oh, timing is bad. Uh, so I will skip this. Uh, server push, uh, say you want to create some push. So you create push builder, add header, path push, that's it. Uh, for JSF 2.3, there were many small improvements. Uh, I've heard something like 600 uh, Chiras has been addressed within this version of the API. Most important are perhaps better CDI integration, Java time support, WebSocket integration, AJAX method invocation. Uh, as I've mentioned at the beginning, beginning uh, uh, one of the goals was some CDI alignment and CDI related improvements. So with CD, CDI 2.0, a uh, few more things came in. Uh, first thing and most important one is that the API or the spec has been split into three parts. So the Java SE and EE versions of the spec are split and based or extending some core. Uh, I think it's clear that uh, in Java SE part of the spec, there is defined API to bootstrap a CDI container in a Java SE environment. For EE environment, that's uh, defined in EE part. Uh, important thing here, uh, 
I would mention is observers ordering and asynchronous events, which I will show you next. In CDI 1.2, if you want to fire some events and want to, wanted to observe them, like in this example, uh, I have one uh, debit event which has been fired, and I have two observers, A and B. But uh, how can I know which observer will be handled first? I can't say that. Uh, so in uh, version 2.0, uh, priority annotation has been leveraged, and this allows you to prioritize which observer comes first to handle the event. Uh, this change was possible due to the change in uh, common annotations, JSR, which allows or was updated to allow priority to be defined on, uh, on a parameter. Uh, asynchronous events are new feature in CDI 2.0. Uh, basically, you observe async. In this case, priority doesn't make sense. Right? It's asynchronous, so how you would know that this one came first. Uh, same time, uh, type of event can be fired both, uh, synchronously and asynchronously, uh, and eligible observers correspond to how event was fired. Uh, and uh, asynchronous observers are called in new lifecycle context and new transaction context. As for bin validation, uh, again, improvements related to Java SE8, support for new daytime API, constraint applied to applicable co to collection elements, optional wrappers, repeatable annotations. Uh, I would perhaps stop here because repeatable annotations is one of the things which we tried to incorporate or apply in a whole platform. So uh, in most MRs we did, we try to leverage this uh, functionality or this feature of SE8. And bin validation also introduces uh, new constraints. Here are some examples. So say we want to constrain the property to be in the past. Uh, here we can see uh, the usage of repeating annotation and some new annotations. Again, optional is supported. We can also constrain uh, in container element use constra constraints in container elements. Uh, security API. Uh, I will go quickly through this. Uh, Security API for Java EE is new thing in EE8. Uh, it defines three key areas. It defines identity store, authentication mechanism, and security context. Identity store is basically uh, used to standardize application accessible identity store. It's uh, responsible for validating caller's credential and or accessing uh, related identity attributes. And it's used by authentication mechanism. The mechanism is there to simplify application accessible mechanism. And security context is standardized, the platform-wide security context. Uh, basically, these days, or before EE8, uh, in EJBs, there was a special API to get uh, princ uh, user principle. The same was, or similar method was in uh, servlet API. And this API tries to standardize this to one common place, and but also allows you to use for uh, earlier versions of the API. Uh, identity store itself provides a storage system uh, where caller uh, can perform validation and de details retrieval. Basically, you pass in a caller name and password, and it 
as an output you get color name and or associated group. It does not interact with the color. Uh, there are two built-in identity stores, uh, LDAP and the database identity stores. Uh, this is how a, a definition can look like. So it can be defined through some data source called and so on. Uh, if I want to protect some servlet, I can uh, set their secu uh, servlet security annotation and put in HTTP constraint, set it to some role. And then I want to uh, use database identity, identity store to find out the user and uh, his role. Uh, most important API from identity store interface validate and get color groups. Uh, authentication mechanism is CDI enabled version of server out module that uh, complies to just pick servlet container profile. Uh, it's encouraged to use an identity store. So there are some built in versions. So if you are using basic form or form authentication, it's provided in the platform. Uh, I will skip this and let's take a look at an, uh, at an example. Again, I have some servlet which I want to secure and I want to use my own authentication mechanism. So I will implement it and all I have to do is implement just one method validate request. Uh, what I get is identity store handle so whatever is bound to this, I can use it. Uh, security context, uh, it, as I said, it supersedes uh, HTTP server request get user principle, uh, is user in role, same methods in EJB. So you can either use this old or just one new API. To sum this up, uh, Basically, the point was to modernize, modernize and simplify the platform as a whole. Uh, I think the slide says it all. Uh, these were uh, main JSRs of EE8. There was also a bunch of uh, maintenance releases done. Notable ones are Java Persistence 2.0.2, uh, Java Mail, Common Annotations, uh, WebSockets, and uh, another set of uh, updates were done to JAXWS, Sage, JAXB, and Java Activation Framework. Uh, but uh, starting uh, EE8, uh, the definition or of the dependency on these uh, specification were moved to be provided by the platform, by the SE platform. Till now, or till EE7, there was direct dependency of, on a specific version of these APIs, but uh, starting e, from EE8, it's uh, defined as provided by platform. Uh, I will stop shortly at JPA 2.2, what's new there. Basically, support for repeatable annotations. There are like 14 of them. Uh, some basic support for J, uh, Java 8 date and time API. Only these five data types are supported. And they were chosen mainly because JDBC specification supports only these five as well. So we didn't want to go any further just to limit the scope to what's supported by JDBC itself. And support CDI injection in attribute converters. So what's EE today? Uh, it's Java EE 5, uh, 5, 8, uh, which was released in September, so about a month ago. Glassfish 5 it's op is open source uh, reference implementation. It's on GitHub. It's open 
anyone can look at the code, can try to code, can try to build it, can participate in uh, discussions. But what's next? Uh, Java EE, or the key message here is that the development of Java EE uh, is being moved to Eclipse Foundation as we speak. Uh, and EE8, Java EE8, is likely the last one provided by Oracle. Uh, that's what I know. Uh, as for the move to EEA, uh, to Eclipse Foundation, uh, it's work in progress. Uh, if you want to participate, uh, you can join a discussion at uh, EE4J community at eclipse.org. And latest status or latest update on this is that uh, there will be some approval process uh, next Monday, I think. Uh, project Charter link is here. You can uh, review it. You can join the uh, mailing list, ask their questions, or check what's going on. And I think two or three days ago, it was announced that uh, first projects to be transferred to Eclipse Foundation or to EE4J uh, are going to be Eclipse Link and Yason. Eclipse Link is JPA, uh, reference implementation of JPA, and Yason is reference implementation of JSONB. Uh, these two projects were chosen mainly because they are al already hosted at Eclipse.org, so it should be easier to move them to EE4J project or under EE4J umbrella. Uh, the goal is to um, move the stuff there as soon as possible. And what you can expect once uh, the sources and everything will be on uh, Eclipse.org, uh, we want to basically build some release which should be identical to uh, current E8 release. Just the name of the product may be different, or maybe some packages, but binary, at the binary level, it should be identical. Okay, so questions? If there are any. Yeah? Uh, I'm not sure to which extent. Maybe it will be just some lower level stuff which is not exposed outside. But uh, I mean, Java APIs will definitely not change the package. What's under Java or Java.x, it won't change. But it may happen that some com, sun, XML, bind, internal, or something like this may change. We don't know yet. Uh, we will see. I'm. It may happen, but basically, if you have an application running on Glassfish now, you should be able to take it and run it on the server provided by EE4J project. That's the goal. We are basically not doing any changes now to EE-related projects. Just legal things, uh, clean up code, making sure everything satisfies lawyers, requirements from Eclipse Foundations, and so on. Um, and what is the effect on the uh, schedule for Java EE9? Uh, last year it was announced that it should be released uh, next year. Is that still the plan, or will that change? Uh, my latest information is that this will be up to the EE4J community and people around it. I believe that, uh, that and that's my personal opinion, that uh, some people from Oracle might be uh, involved into that, but uh, I haven't heard anything official. So I don't know. 
And I think there will be some F F FAQ posted by David Delabasi uh, within a couple of days. So maybe you get answer there. <laughs> and me too. <laughs> okay, time's up. Thank you.